Hi guys, it is a frosty Monday morning here in the end times. We have made it to Monday, October 13th, 2014, Monday morning in Paonia, Colorado, while all my fellow Paonians do whatever the hell they're doing this time of year to support the local economy in Paonia. I'm certainly not invited in on that, so since I have nothing better to do with my life after uprooting it to move here to join the local economy, I will just do what I would be doing anywhere else. And that is bringing you my Monday morning healthy economy, sick planet, healthy planet, sick economy rant where I try to just illustrate the inverse relationship between a healthy economy and planets as I go on the mainstream media, meaning the Yahoo Finance pages, to bring you more evidence of how when one gets better, the other one gets worse. And, good Lord, uh, I've actually got seven stories so let me dive right into it. Let's see what our friends over there at the IMF and the World Bank, the banksters behind it all, behind when you do when you go all the way back to who is killing this planet, it is the banksters behind it all and the twin engines of the global banksters would be the IMF and the World Bank. This little uh, evil bitch, uh, Christina Lagarde, uh, leading the pack at the IMF. So anyway, what is the global banksters' cure for the slowdown in the global economy? Well, taking their cue, their cue from uh, FDR, I guess, how about this idea? Build more infrastructure to fight malaise. Malaise. I like this. Um, the terms are hardly riveting. The new mediocre secular stagnation, structural reform, lowflation but underpinning the economic geek speak at the IMF World Bank's annual meeting were deep worries that the global economy is slipping backward, as the meetings this week were fraught with concerns that the world still has not achieved escape velocity from the economic crisis and for people around the world, that means, in real language, flat incomes and few new jobs. As the IMF has repeatedly cut its growth forecast since the beginning of the year. And uh, anyway, they break all this down, but what is... What is uh, what are they going to do about it? What are these banksters going to do about it? Uh, about what Christina Lagarde calls as the hole dug by the Great Recession. Well, how about build more infrastructure? There you go. Uh, infrastructure as remedy. The strong message to all governments was to make their own specific efforts to fuel economic growth. G. And the new mantra was job generating investment in infrastructure, <clears throat> where the need was put at more than $1 trillion a year around the world. Quote, this is from the World Bank's uh, one that some guy Kim. In order to fight poverty, you need to build infrastructure. That's from the World Bank, 
and our and little queen Christina quote infrastructure and investment in infrastructure can be a good way to support growth in the short term by putting people to work by launching major construction efforts and as part of this the World Bank has launched a new global infrastructure facility aimed at bringing public and private money together to support projects in low and middle income countries. So there you go. When the economy when the economy goes sour, what do you do? Just like FDR did back in the 30s when he started building all of these goddamn roads and hydroelectric dams and all of this shit. What do you do to revive a flagging economy? You attack a planet. You ramp up planet eating. This is more and more of these global banksters' money going to be pumped in to, well, as I just said, more and more highways, railroads, airports, power lines, pipelines, hydroelectric dams. Do, do, do you get it? There is no better way to revive an economy than to kill a planet. It, it is the obvious choice for planet eaters. And then I guess an associated story to that, uh, talking about, a, about infrastructure. This one out of the Philippines. Urban decay threatens hot Philippine economy. Manila's creaking train network means a miserable three-hour work commute for salesman Gerald Galang. Just one example of major infrastructure woes that analysts say threaten to cool the Philippines' red-hot economy. There you go. Peak hour hell comes in many forms in the city of 12 million people with commuters experiencing a sweaty, stinky crush on dilapidated trains and giant lines to buy tickets, blah, blah, blah. And once again, so what, so what you see here it, 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 this is just an, just a, a, a microcosmic example of that story I was just talking about. Uh, so what is the Philippines planning to do? It's a win-win situation for the planet eaters. Build more infrastructure, breaking down all of Manila's plans for all of these goddamn new super highways. Uh, going all up and all over the damn uh, islands, out going out from the from, the, from Manila, uh, the, the airport, the new airport going in there, so they can bring more and more planes in and out of the Philippines, ramp up uh, air traffic, put more roads as more and more Filipinos are able to buy cars, and you see all of this will keep their economy chugging along and with every victory for the economy that is, that is one more uh, defeat for the planet. This isn't rocket science, people. This is how this whole model of infinite growth on a finite planet spells disaster for the finite planet. Okay, and we're just going, let's see, I was over there in the Philippines, so let's stay over there in Red Hot Asia, and then we will end up in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, what is going on in China? I, 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 I love this, guys. Talk, talk about being completely schizophrenic psycho is the uh, news today. Half the article saying how China is nosediving the other half 
Uh, well, here you go. It depends on which side you want to believe, I guess. This is from the French news service. All right, China's exports and imports surge ahead of expectations. Well, this isn't that wonderful. Uh, China's exports and imports both rose more than expected in September. Customs data showed Monday in a positive signal for the world's second largest economy, which is one more way of saying a negative signal for the world's only planet. There is no a second largest planet. Guys, uh, we have one planet and every goddamn economy on it is trying to kill it. The country's trade surplus more than doubled year on year to $31 billion as exports rose 15.3% to $213.7 billion, while imports climbed 7% to $182.7 billion. Oh, D, 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 D. These, these positive figures are the latest contradictory indicator, yeah, contradictory indicator for China's economy, a key driver of global growth. It is the key driver of global growth. So let's zero in on just one. And then let's go over here to Bloomberg. Let's just look at one example of what's going on in the Chinese economy as Bloomberg cheers on this news. China copper ore imports jump to record as smelters boost demand. There you go. China's imports of copper ore and concentrate climbed for a second month to a record as the world's biggest producer of the refined metal boost capacity. Inba inbound shipments, meaning coming from all over this planet, uh, I think uh, a hell of a lot of it coming out of Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, coming out of South America. I know there's some, some uh, giant copper mines down there. I could get off on a whole rant about this copper mine uh, in the Intag River Valley in Ecuador, absolutely bringing in rape pillage and environmental destruction on a monumental scale uh, down there at the Intag copper mine in, in Ecuador as Rafael Correa ramps up his efforts to sell Ecuador to Chinese copper miners and oil drillers. So that's what they're talking about when you read these words in inbound shipments of partly treated ore rose 34% to 1.29 million tons in September alone. 1.29 million tons and that's just the ore and you gotta understand for, for every ton of ore that actually makes it on the boat to China the, the millions if not billions of tons uh, of these toxic mine tailings poisoning the, uh, the waters, the rivers all over this planet. Okay, imports through the first nine months of the year are 20% higher than the same period last year. The record shipments come as smelters in the world's largest metals consumer ramp up their production capacity. There you go. China produced 
681,000 tons of refined copper in August, climbing 7.4% from the previous month and 21% from the same month last year. And the country added 50,000 tons per month of smelting capacity from April to July and will bring online more than 1 million tons per year of new capacity next year. There you go. Uh, all right, so that is what is going on in China, but you understand the real story is not in China. The real story is everywhere from Ecuador to Peru to, to God knows where these planet eaters are getting this stuff. That is where the real story is. But anyway, let's go over. i got three uh, stories to talk about from Sub-Saharan Africa. I mentioned uh, these stories last week and I want to talk about them again right here from AP. Ebola deflating hopes for three poor African economies. Just as their economies had begun to recover from the man-made horrors of coup and civil war, the West African nations of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone have been knocked down by a terrifying force of nature, the Ebola virus, another term for a terrifying force of nature is Mother Nature bringing out her broom by bringing out one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, in this case being disease. This is Mother Nature's latest weapon to defend herself, both from the multinational planet eaters and just the rising tide uh, of, of humanity. I wish you could see this photograph. My God! My God! Uh, you, you go, Mother Nature. In addition to the human toll, more than 4,000 dead so far, the outbreak has paralyzed economic life. Across the Ebola zone, shops are closed, hotels vacant, flights canceled, fields untended, and investments on hold. The World Bank has dramatically downgraded its expectations for economic growth this year in the three countries hardest hit by the outbreak. And so all of this is, um, is broken down. Quote, this is some foreign aid expert from Georgetown University. Quote, no one could have imagined the extent of the economic and social turnaround. The past 10 years, there has been remarkable progress and a lot of investors coming in uh, Ebola has frozen that economic revival. Quote from the World Bank's Economists for Africa, quote, they were coming back and now have been set back in a big way as the epidemic damages the economy directly as commerce stops blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I'm going to go from there and they're going to zero in as I was cheering on uh, last week. Let's go back to Bloomberg and look at the, probably the single hardest hit sector of them all. And that would be the mining sector as mining 
has come to a virtual standstill in West Africa. There you go. The, these planet-eating, multinational, giant iron ore mines by all of this foreign investment into sub-Saharan Africa. Take it away, Bloomberg. In Ebola-stricken Sierra Leone, mining price war deepens crisis. Hallelujah. In Sierra Leone, one of the poorest countries in Africa, the hardships of Ebola hit at victims and non-victims alike. And uh, then they, they interview some minor, I guess. And now things are about to get worse again. Iron ore, the biggest export earner, is in a major tailspin. Thank you to Mother Nature bringing out her broom, leaving Sierra Leone's two mines on the verge of collapse and jeopardizing 16% of gross domestic product in a country where output per person was just $809 last year. And used in steel making, iron ore has slumped 39% this year as the world's largest... Uh, uh, okay, here we go. Anyway, uh, but, but don't worry. Don't worry, uh, it, it, all you people uh, investing in iron ore mining, uh, don't think that this story coming out of West Africa uh, it means good news for a planet. It does mean good news for West Africa, for the planet in West Africa. So when, when these planet eaters uh, get faced with something like this, what do they do? What do iron ore investors do? Okay, uh, used in steel making, iron ore has slumped 39% this year as the world's largest miners spend billions of dollars expanding giant pits in Australia and Brazil. And uh, so, and now these guys in Western Sub-Saharan Africa can no longer compete with these giant pits in Australia and Brazil. And uh, let's see, I think it, let's, let's go jump over from, uh, let's go look at Australia and Brazil. Okay, uh, well, let's look to the Rio Tinto Group plans to raise its capacity in Australia to 360 million tons a year. That is 1 million tons per day uh, from mines in Western Australia and Brazil's Vale already the biggest producer of the commodity, wants to double its shipments to China in five years. So you can look for these pits in Brazil to double in uh, five years. Uh, any, anyway, uh, I think we've heard enough of this. And anyway, but don't worry, you planet eaters, if you think all the news is bad out of, out of Western Sub-Saharan Africa, Bloomberg does have a ray of hope, a ray of hope. Coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a ray of hope for the planet eaters as we see Nigerian law may usher in billion dollar steel pipe business. Steel pipe manufacturing in Nigeria is set to expand 
on the back of a law that res reserves supplies to the energy industry for local companies. The 2010 Nigerian Content Act requires international energy companies working in the nation's oil and gas industry uh, to buy from local companies to meet their annual demand of 800,000 metric tons a year. And here we have Shell, Chevron, Exxon, blah, 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 all now run joint ventures with state-owned Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation that pump most of the country's oil. All right, and we'd like to see four to five pipe mills in the country with demand for steel pipes increasing as the country builds new gas pipe networks and replaces old ones. Uh, Nigeria is Africa's biggest economy and oil producer and has the continent's largest gas reserves. And the government is expanding under a plan to meet its electricity needs, the government is expanding the country's pipeline network to reach far-flung power stations. And if you are not aware of this, let uh, this planet eater from Nigeria, Norbert Olia, explain it to you. Quote, the lifeblood of the oil industry is pipelines. As important as the oil well is, that is how important the pipe is. The lifeblood. Guys, smoke them if you got them. Uh, does anyone not understand the, the connection between a healthy economy and a sick planet and vice versa, which leads to the conclusion, the inescapable conclusion, the only conclusion, there is one way to save this planet, and that is to bring down the biggest threat to this planet, which is the global industrial economy, which of course is another way of saying depopulate this planet by 90%, because that is what will happen if we bring down the global industrial economy. And uh, anyway, I'm not going to get off into that rant. I'm just going to wrap up this week's Healthy Planet Sick Economy rant for Monday morning, October 13th, 2014, and head out for another day, another cold winter day of unemployment in Paonia, Colorado, while, as I've heard, uh, anyway, I won't even go there. I will simply say, bye guys.